faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that with you nothing is impossible, Lord. We thank you for that reminder continuously by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you encourage us, amen, to trust in you, to trust in your word, that it will come to pass even as you have spoken. And we receive that by faith right now, Lord, for whatever the need might be, whatever the situation that's confronting us, we declare the victory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. No weapon formed against us will prosper, but every tongue that rises against us, we condemn. Amen. By the word of God. Hallelujah. In the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. You may be seated. Amen. I want to just uh, thank... Uh, Suzanne and Mike, as always, for all the things that they're doing. I give her a call in the middle of the week and ask her about a song, and she jumps right on it, amen, and has it here. And I want to thank Sarah for uh, texting me and asking about the song, amen. I appreciate you all being out there. It makes, you, makes us feel a little more connected, amen, even though everybody can't be here. Thank God for those of you that are here, and thank God for all of you that are with us uh, via the Internet on Facebook, and we appreciate that so much. I'm really excited this morning to uh, praise the Lord for Jacob getting uh, baptized, and that was a fantastic thing. We got to see the little uh, video, and thank God for that. Amen. That's a major milestone in your life, brother. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm glad you took the step of faith. Amen. And not only has Jesus already cleansed you, but now you've identified with that cleansing through baptism. Amen. And that's a powerful uh, statement. Amen. And uh, we're grateful for that. Amen. Good to see Peter here. I know his job has kept him pretty well wrapped up on Sundays, but uh, I, I'm grateful for his uh, con continued support. Amen. Uh, if he's not here, he's here in the spirit. Amen. And, and uh, we're, we're just grateful to Jamie coming when they're able to and uh, uh, kind of, you know, like uh, reminding us the family's here, even if they're not all here physically. Amen. They're here together in the spirit. So praise the Lord for that. Again, Darn and Darlene are going to be leaving uh, tomorrow. We're going to miss them. But we stay in touch and uh, through the Internet and texting and phone calls and so forth. And I know they're connected with us through the church. They've been supporters, as all of you have. And I, I'm grateful for that. Uh, in times that were not so good and when times were great, uh, amen, still uh, faithful to the house of God and to, to this local congregation. And we appreciate that so much, all of you. Tim, great job as always. Such a blessing. Amen. Just all, everybody here, amen. John, I'm looking at you, buddy. Praise the Lord. He's ignoring me. Uh, Ron, uh, faithful as always, amen. Rita and Eric, just that God bless you guys. They came by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Rita was moved on by the Holy Spirit to come. They've been faithful to that word from the Lord, and uh, we appreciate that so much. Just love to hear her worship and, and uh, participate. And just lifts my spirits, amen, when everybody else gets excited. Can't help but get excited with them. Praise God. So thank the Lord again for all of you being here. Thank for all that God is doing. Amen. And uh, will continue to do for us who are believers. Praise the Lord. You know what you get when you cross the Atlantic with the Titanic? About halfway. Praise the Lord. Yeah, go ahead. You can be mean if you want to, but I'm, I'm not going to stop. Praise the Lord. You want to know what you call a Chinese communist with one leg? Taiwan shoe. As long as we're on that, <laughs> that yeah, yeah, okay. As long as we're on the, the subject, uh, Confucius say, "Man who runs behind car gets exhausted, <laughs> but man who runs in front of car gets tired." <laughs> These are things you could write down. They're important issues. You know, when I, years ago, when I was in the service, uh, especially when I was on the East Coast before I went overseas. Uh, I was in, stationed in North Carolina and South Carolina, and we used to take bus all the time. It was about the only way, because I didn't have a car. Very few of us had cars, and uh, hitchhiking wasn't uh, that great on the East Coast. You got more rides on the West Coast, but anyway, on the East Coast, you had to take a bus if you wanted to go anywhere. So we'd go up to Washington, D.C. every chance we got um, for a lot of reasons, just because it was someplace we'd never been before, and there was a lot of things going on there at the time. But uh, so riding the bus one day, uh, this woman got on the bus, and uh, the driver said, ooh, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. And she came back and sat down in front of me, and she was just fuming. You know, I mean, she was irate. And said, the driver just insulted me. And I said, I'll tell you what, you go tell him off. I'll hold your monkey. 
ugly baby. Okay, praise the Lord. She didn't think it was funny either. Praise God. All right, well, God is good, amen, and uh, he's on the throne, praise the Lord. And I want to talk to you a little bit more uh, this morning. Last week we were talking about really uh, about the experience of having received the Holy Spirit and how people get confused over that in, in so many ways, uh, partly because of the confusion that takes place within the ministry and uh, religion itself about the, about the Holy Spirit. But, so I want to talk to you a little more about the Holy Spirit, not so much about receiving it. I hope we've covered all that, but, um, or as much as we could anyway, but how the Holy Spirit actually is working and how he does work in us and through us. And so I want to begin then this morning with 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 21. Praise God. So the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen. Praise the Lord. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So God predominantly uh, reveals himself by his word. And it, it's like it was in the day of uh, Samuel. It's the same today. Nothing really about that has changed. When it says that the Lord appeared, it's saying something amazing if you really look at it. God wasn't seen with the eyes of the head, amen, but with the eyes of the heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. And even though that seems strange in the natural, that seeing at Shiloh happened by the word of the Lord. Amen. As the word was heard, the Lord was seen. Yes. Praise God. And so in the hearing was the seeing. Yes. The spiritual hearing of God's word becomes the spiritual seeing of God's glory. Hallelujah. I mean, it's the same in the gospel today. Paul says, we just read in, 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 uh, in Corinthians, that uh, the becoming a Christian means, when you become a Christian, what it really means is we're seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Amen? So in this age, or this dispensation, God reveals himself to the world mainly through the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, amen, by means of the written word, God inspired it by the Holy Ghost. Amen? So look at this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17. Matthew 16 and 17. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So he's saying it was the Holy Spirit, amen, that revealed this to you. Amen. Not somebody, not some person. Amen. And so uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, her, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So here's what she said. She heard us. She heard words, right? And the result of hearing those words, amen, the Lord opened her heart or opened her up and she intend, uh, so that she attended unto the things which Paul said, right? So she heard and God, because of what she heard, God opened her up to those things that, that Paul was saying, the, the, the word of God, so that she could operate in it. 
so that she could do those things, amen, that Paul was talking about, okay? And so the Holy Spirit doesn't awaken, doesn't strengthen faith, except by the Word of God. Amen? Romans 10, 17. And this is literally, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That translation literally is by the Word of Christ. Amen? And so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. And the reason is, and... We talked about it, some of this stuff last week, as I said. But the Spirit came into the world for a purpose. And the purpose for the Spirit to come into the world was to glorify Christ. Amen? And so uh, Christ wouldn't be glorified if the Holy Ghost awakened faith outside of a revelation of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? I mean, the only way the Holy Spirit... Uh, brings faith is by a revelation of Jesus. He doesn't bring faith any other way. He doesn't just come and supernaturally plug us into faith. He comes with the supernatural knowledge or the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that starts faith. That's where faith begins. Amen? John 16, verses 13 and 14. So how be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So he's not talking about anything outside of Jesus. That's what's going to bring the faith. And of course, we know the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word and God were one, right? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. So the Spirit of God produces both a subconscious influence that brings us to faith and a conscious experience of power and then awakens, uh, uh, amen, or gives us an awareness of God personally that brings us to faith. Now let me explain something to you, because this has bothered me over the years. I've thought about these scriptures and studied them different times throughout my ministry, the times that I've... Uh, tried to figure this out, but so the, the Holy Spirit, he produces a subconscious influence that brings us to faith, and that brings us to a conscious experience of power and awakens the reality of God personally, and that brings faith, right? So I'll, I'll try to explain it, but that explains two different things. First, this is why the scripture can speak of the Holy Spirit blowing where it listeth, or, or blowing where he wills, amen? And having mercy, or extending grace to us, amen? Having grace, gracious a, uh, uh, effects, I would say, in our lives before we actually choose them. Yes. I mean, how many of you know God's blessed you in some ways before you ever came to know the Lord in any real degree? I mean, I look back at my life and I don't know really where that happened. If it was when I was a child and trusted in the Lord, if it was when I received a physical evidence of the Holy Spirit, I don't know. All I know is there was a hand of protection on me for a long, long time before I was ever living for God. Amen? And, and, and uh, even stupid choices I've made since then, that blessing has still been there. That protection has still been there. So let's look at this now, John chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 8. John 3, verses 6 through 8. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes from, and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So let's think about this for a minute. So the Holy Spirit, it goes wherever, wherever it is wanting to go, right? And we hear it, the sound of it. In other words, we... we there's a witness somehow in us that the, the Holy Spirit is doing or that God is moving, right? But we don't know where this is coming from because we're not born again yet. We don't understand the Word of God. We haven't been exposed to any of those things. All we know is something stirred in me to look to God or to think about God or to reach out or to hope and so forth, right? And so when it comes and whether it goes, we don't know how, we don't understand that. And so is everybody that's born of the Spirit. So he's saying when we get born again, it doesn't start out with this huge knowledge about God and theology and everything else. It starts out with just something kind of drawing us, kind of just opening us up to the fact that there could be a God, that maybe this is God, that who knows, you know what I'm saying? 
All right? So look at ch uh, chapter 6 now and verse 36 and 37. Still in John 3. Or excuse me, still in John, but chapter 6, verses 36 and 37. Have I completely confused you yet? I'm, I'm working on it. Don't give up. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Praise the Lord. Verse 44. No man can come to me. Now think about this. Nobody can come to me except the Father which has sent me, or the Spirit, because God is a Spirit, draws him. And then I, that person that God draws to me, that, he, that can't come to me on his own, that has to be the Holy Spirit to, to initiate this, but we just read a moment ago, right? And I will raise that person up on the last day. In other words, they're going to be saved, right? So verse 65. And he said, therefore, said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father, or except there was some inkling or some inclination from the spirit. Okay? All right. So in other words, the unconscious influence is he works in us, in our lives, so that we then will hear and accept the word. And then two, it's also why the spirit comes through our hearing the Word of God. Amen? To say it another way, let's, let's look at it like this. Conscious awareness or the presence of the Spirit is given when we hear the Word of God with faith. I mean, we, how many times we read a scripture or we heard a scripture or whatever, it was just words. All right? Until the Spirit moved on us. Right? And then all of a sudden things begin to open up. We begin to think, well, maybe that could be true. Maybe that's possible, right? But it's the Holy Spirit that draws us and makes it possible for us to then hear the Word and apply faith with it, exercise faith with it, okay? So uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. He, there, he therefore that minister, ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Amen? By hearing with faith. Hearing obviously implies that somebody said something, some, some words were spoken, right? And so, hearing that word with faith was the means by which the Holy Spirit was then given. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What I'm saying is, God initiates this whole thing. It is, none, none of it's about us. We think it was the journey we were on. It was the problems. No. The Holy Spirit came to us and stirred up something in us. Amen. So that we would be open then to the Word of God so that faith could come. Faith for what? Faith to believe that that initial thing was real. And then that gives credence to everything that comes after that, right? That initial stirring, we didn't know what it was. We, you know, we might have been chasing all kinds of weird stuff, not knowing what this desire, this hunger, this yearning, this longing, this kind of disconnecting from other stuff, what it was about. But it was the Holy Spirit making us dissatisfied with the things that were around us to cause us to look to God. So that God could then impart faith to us by His Word. Am I making some sense? Praise the Lord. So, so John, look at John 6.44 again. Or, yeah, 6.44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So here, here's what I'm saying is, this is all about God's love for us. He come looking for us. We talk about he came running down that prodigal road. Well, we're talking about this is somebody who left the Father and came back. Well, we, we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. So father, the Father is saying, you were dead, but now you're alive. My son was dead, but now he's alive, right? Well, the son was never dead. He was just dead to the Father because he was separated from him. Am I right? And that's the same thing God is saying to us. You come back. You were dead. But now you're alive, and he comes running to you, puts the robe of righteousness, sandals on your feet, the ring of uh, authority, and so forth, right? That's just a, a perfect analogy of what the Holy Spirit does with us, drawing us to God. Somewhere out there, the, devil, the, 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 the young man, us, was living 
like a hog. I mean, he was living way beneath his, his position at what he was supposed to be, right? And one day it just came to him. Wow, I've got a, there's a father somewhere, right? And I'm going to go to him. And I'm going to make this all possible by, you know, submitting to him, by falling before him, begging him for forgiveness, working for him and everything else. So that's the Holy Spirit drawing him. So he goes, he doesn't understand it, but he's going. And as he goes, the, the father comes running to him and gives him faith. Faith in what? That you are still my son. You never, and nothing changed as far as I was concerned. It was just your position, not your identity. Amen. And so that's what the Holy Ghost does to us. He comes to us and awakens us to something more than what we are. And that opens us up to the possibility of hearing the Word of God and then receiving faith from it. Praise the Lord. So the Spirit comes unconsciously before we trust Him. Amen. And that enables us to believe in God's Word. Amen. And the Spirit comes consciously then because of the Word. In response to our trusting Him, amen, are you with me? And gives conscious experience, amen, of His presence through His Word. Praise the Lord. Think about it when we're dealing with unbelievers. See, the Holy Spirit is so, so important. That's why we need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to go before us, for the Holy Spirit to speak to people. And Because without that, we're just beating our heads against a wall. But if the Holy Spirit's working with them, this Word will come alive. We can start sharing some things with about our experiences and what God has done for us and what God is doing in us and, and, and things like that. And then faith can come as a result of that. Praise the Lord. That's what Paul calls the joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 6. See, it's not... Here's the point I'm trying to make is we don't save anybody. We just open the door for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is in us. We can carry that that reality to them, so that faith can then come and they can believe in God. They can trust God and be born again. Amen? So you became, and look, a lot of it is just us being light. Tim talked about it. Let me, I'm going to come back to this, but I was thinking about this when Tim was talking. He said, uh, Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said, well, I know, I know he's going to rise again at some point. And Jesus goes on to say, I am, right, I am the resurrection I am the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall not die. Believest thou this? Now then in verse 42 he says, And I knew that thou hearest me always. He's talking to the Father. This is, he said, I only said that for their sake. You know, Father, you know, he prayed the prayer. He said, I prayed the prayer for them. I know that you always hear me, right? So he says, you always hear me. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Right? So he's saying, I'm going to share the word. I'm going to share some words with them so that they will know. So that faith can arise. Right? Now let, think about this. And I'll get to this again too. But the point is, these are Jews. So they have a belief in God. It's just their belief is screwed up. They believe in a God. So they already have that awareness is there. All they need to have is some, some validation. And so Jesus uses the word. Right? And that stirs them up. Praise the Lord. And so he, go, he goes on to talk about uh, it's the spirit that brings life, right? It's, it's, not, it's not your effort. It's not your religion. But it's the spirit. The word is spirit and it's life. Yes. Amen. And so he, you became, here, and we'll go back to the scripture we had here. And you became followers of us. And of the Lord. This is Paul talking about it. And he said, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. Praise God. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. And this again is what Tim was also referring to when he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Praise the Lord. So, not only does the first act of faith come by hearing, but every subsequent act of faith comes the same way. 
So today, even though we have had faith and we have experienced faith in God and, and, and different ways and the Word of God, the faith I need for my next ex situation or next circumstance is going to come the same way it came for me to get born again. The Holy Spirit will move on the Word of God, quicken that to me, make it real to me, and give me faith for whatever it is I need. That's why if i got an illness, I need to go find a scripture, amen, that says, by His stripes you were healed. That will bring faith, right? And so whatever it is we're confronted with, that's where the Word of God comes in. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. It doesn't just happen by a, a amassing of faith over the years. Faith comes the same way every single time, from the first time to the last time. By the word of God. Amen. And so not only does the first act of faith come by hearing, every, every act of faith comes the same way. We have to still function by the word of God. We don't have faith just in somebody else's experience, although that's good. It can encourage us. The faith comes by the word of God. Amen. John 10.10. So the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it up more abundantly. So Jesus came for a purpose, and the purpose was that our life would be an abundant life. It wouldn't just be eking out an existence somehow or stretching, you know, trying to make it ends meet or, or trying to survive the corona or whatever it is. No, he came to give us a life that was abundant, that was more than enough, that was exceeding more than any, any normal life would be, right? So look at John now, chapter 6, verses 63. Verse 63, excuse me. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, or gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Praise the Lord. So the spirit quickens it, and the words that he gives us, validates that and makes the life reality, makes it true. Amen? Gives us faith for that. So the words that John wrote, and actually all Scripture, lead to life. Real life. True life. Not just existence as a human, but the life. The life of God. Amen? And he's, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The life we get from bread is physical. Right? I mean, the life we get from food and nourishment, physical nourishment, is, is just physical. It doesn't do anything for our spirit other than to keep the body alive so we could learn more about God. So that's what Jesus was talking about. But we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The life that we get from bread is fragile. It's short. It's temporary. Right? But the life that we get from the word is solid. It's unchangeable. It's eternal. Whoa, hallelujah. I'm feeling that right now. Praise the Lord. It's eternal life. It's, it's, a, it's a life that is filled with strength. It's an abundant life. It's not just getting by, not just hoping I can make it through this. No, it's, it's standing tall and saying, all good things will come to me. Amen. God will bless me. Amen. God will bless my family. God will save my children, grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Amen. John 17, 13 through 18. So it comes, we, look, we, we deal with people and we think, oh, God, they don't know what. No, the Holy Spirit could be quick dealing with them. You know, in the dark night, in the middle of the night, this may be somebody who's just, you would think to look at them, they're just totally disconnected from God. But the Holy Spirit can move on them in those night seasons, in those times when they're questioning and they're wondering, well, is this all it is? Is it always going to be like this? Will it never get changed? Will it? And that's the Holy Spirit stirring something in them so that when you come along, and the Holy Spirit will connect you with those people. Amen. Either, through, either because they are your family, either because they're people you already have connections with, or somehow He'll bring them to you. And this has happened, I'm sure, to all of us. And you just feel this overpowering sense that I need to say something to them. It doesn't necessarily have to be a scripture, but it has to be something that connects with scripture. Something that, you know, you know God bless you. God loves you, you know. I know what you're going through. I've been there. I've done that. You know, those kinds of things just to help them to connect, right? But he said, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is talking about the Holy Spirit, amen, moving on the Word of God. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them. Amen. Have you ever shared the Lord with somebody who wasn't ready for the Lord? 
It could get ugly in a hurry. I had a guy throw beer at me. I had a, Sally will tell you, they ran us out of the house. We were standing on the front step, and a guy threw a beer can or a beer bottle, I don't remember which it was now, full of beer. If it hadn't all spilled, I would have had a drink probably, but no, I'm just saying. They did not want this. He didn't want any part of it. Amen? And so, but, but others do. So we don't know. We just have to be led by the Spirit, right? So I have given them my, thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. So we're, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I pray not uh, to sanctify them through thy truth, or set them apart because of the word. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, now get this, this is a powerful thing. Why did he send Jesus into the world? To glorify God, to bring people to the knowledge of God, right? So as you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Our reason for being here is the same as Jesus was. Amen? And so we're going to have to function the way Jesus did. And how did Jesus function? By the Holy Spirit. Right? He never said anything but what the Spirit said or what the Father said. Amen? And that brings us to the reality that we're facing today. The predominant worldview, Darlene and Don and I were talking about it the other day. They came over for lunch. And I said, hey, you're preaching my sermon. And I had to kind of just back away from it. But the predominant worldview that permeates America, since that's where we are and that's our main focus, its inception came from the Bible, from the Word of God. The predominant world view, amen, that permeated America since its inception, since it was created, right, came from the Bible. Now, I'm not saying it was all correct. I'm just saying it was the Bible is what this, found, this nation was founded on, the Word of God, right? And so marriage between a man and a woman, normal, right? Now look, I'm going to say some stuff, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, because all of us are touched by these things. We all have experiences with, or knowledge of, family, friend, somebody who may be, have some sexual identity issues, they can call themselves whatever they want to, but that's all I'm saying, okay? So I'm not trying to be ugly here. We love the people. We love them, yeah. right? But we know that the, the behavior itself is, is uh, negative. Right. It's just not a, a good thing, right? So... In, as we grew up, most of us, and uh, the way the nation was founded, it was founded on biblical principles, right? So there was, there was this, uh, this knowledge of marriage is between male and female. We didn't thought, I didn't grow up questioning, you know, I wonder if somebody made a mistake there, and, right? Or how about murdering babies is wrong? I mean, did... did, did did we ever have a question in our mind that killing millions of babies is all right? It's, it's not bad behavior. It's not wrong. Right? People understood right and wrong because there was an absolute authority. When there's no absolute authority to say what's absolutely right and what's absolutely wrong, what's true and what's lies, then we end up like ancient Israel during the time of the judges. Judges 21, 25. There was no king. Or there was no rule. Right? Everybody just did what was right in their own eyes. That's where we're living today, folks. I mean, as a nation. I'm not talking about us maybe personally. But the world in general. And I'm speaking specifically here of the United States. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The king set the, the rules, set the law, set the truth, right? And then when there wasn't a king, everybody just said, well, this is what I think, so this is what I'm doing. Everybody did that. Now, what's interesting is the very next verse is Ruth chapter 1, and it says, there was a famine in the land. Amen? In Bethlehem, the house of bread. There is a fam not uh, not and the scripture goes on and talks about that in other places not a hunger for food but for the word of God because there was no king everybody did whatever was right in their own eyes and the result was spiritual famine and what happened Ruth 
you know, Naomi, I should say, and, and her husband and the two sons, what did they do? They left Bethlehem, the house of bread. And they went to a foreign land or to a nation where there was no God or there were multiple gods. Well, the interesting thing is the next book after Ruth is 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel it says, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, and revealed himself by the word of God, or made himself visible to Samuel by the word of God. The word's coming back, amen, to wake people up to their need for it, amen? So the more, what the result of this is, the moral relativism, I'll say, of Israel that afflicted Israel back in those days is happening right now in America and around the world. I'm talking about America because I know what America was in the 50s, right? I was a kid growing up in the 50s. And uh, I know it's altogether different. I'm not saying it was per pristine that there weren't, you know, evils and there weren't people doing bad stuff. I'm just saying it was so dramatically different than it is today in every way. We weren't perfect by any means. But the things that affirmed the word of God were everywhere. We say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? We'd sing hymns in school, the Lord's Prayer. It was normal. It was right. If we were corrected, we were corrected basically based on the word of God. Amen? And it was everywhere. You turn on the TV. The few TV shows that were on had Christian values. Roy Rogers. You know, I mean... The Lone Ranger. I can remember them praying. In a, in what you, you can still get the Lone Ranger. It's on some of these offbeat channels, but it's still there. And they'll talk about praying for somebody, you know, <coughs> believe in God. I mean, it was just normal kind of stuff to be having constantly affirmed our faith or our belief in God. As varied as that might have been, we still knew that there was a God, amen, and that he was good. Yes. And we might not have had all the answers, but we had that much, amen. And so what was happening in what's happening today in the United States, and how about the scripture tells us, there's no new thing under the sun. It just keeps like seasons. They just keep changing. And we're seeing the same thing that Israel dealt with several thousand years ago. And it's repeated itself over this over the centuries, but nevertheless, America was at one time, and I'll say maybe even before my childhood. It was an Acts 2 type of culture. It was a, uh, a place where most people consciously or unconsciously had the starting point of God's word for their approach to life. Amen. People believed in God, in their image of God, even though it may have been skewed, it may have needed some correction, but they believed in a God. They believed that there was a God, that there is a God. Amen. And it, Amen. And so, just like with Israel, the reason the Holy Spirit was able to move was because they already believed in God. They just didn't know the intricacies of God. They didn't know the goodness of God. They didn't know the love of God. They just knew that God is. He exists, right? And so, when they came to share the Lord with them, the Jewish people were converting by the thousands. Why? Because the Holy Spirit could speak to them. Because they already believed in God. Because they already had a belief in God, even though it was not correct. Even though it was skewed. Right? So today in America, it's more like Acts chapter 17. Because there's, there's generations, a couple of generations, that don't know anything about God. Don't know that there's a God, don't believe that there's a God, and would never believe, uh, amen, just based on, on, on somebody handing them a scripture. So today, America is like Acts chapter 7. Let's look at this, Acts 17, uh, verses 21 through 28. I'm struggling here. I don't think I'm stretching to make the analogy, but I, it may take a little bit here. So in, in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 21, he says, the Lord appeared, okay, for all the Athenians. Now this is Paul. He's on Mars Hill, right? And he's talking to these Greeks. Amen. And the Greeks don't believe in God, not in Jehovah, right? Not in Jesus. They, all the Athenians and strangers were there, who, which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Philosophy. 
Amen? And so then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The one you don't know is the one I'm wanting to share with you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Praise the Lord. Multiple gods. Multiple gods of their own making. Intellect and philosophy. The starting point here is predominantly man's word. That's what we're, that's what we're seeing in this nation today. The result, moral relativism, meaning whatever is good for you, whatever you think, right? So a lot of Christians see the end times and they say, well, it should be expected, right? I mean, that's, things are going to get bad. Things will get worse. So let's just be done with it. Let them go to hell. But see, that's more fatalism than end time understanding. That's my opinion. Okay, so what's the point of trying to do something? We know the world's going to come to an end, right? Why beat your head? Why beat yourself up over it? Just relax. Amen? They think the worse it gets, the more likely Jesus is going to be coming soon. So we just sit back and wait. But that's not what the Word of God says. In fact, it says just the opposite. Philippians 2.15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Praise the Lord. Paul told the Romans that the truth about the coming of the Lord is supposed to be motivation to wake up and put on the armor of light. Romans 13, 11, and 12. That knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Praise the Lord. Not sit around passively and let everybody go to hell and just say, well, it's, it's what's going to happen. You know, I mean, there's not much we can do about it. But as things get darker around us, the church is supposed to shine brighter. It's an opportunity to work, not an excuse to wait. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We can turn this... And I don't mean that arrogantly. I mean, that's what the Lord told us. We can turn this in to the brightest, most powerful move of God that earth has ever seen. Ever. Because Jesus said, you'll do greater works than I've done. Amen. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, or teaching them to believe the Word of God. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Spirit of God. Amen? 1 Peter 3.15 
But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for, of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. People are going to see some stuff in believers. And they're going to want to know, how is it you're not freaking out like everybody else? In other words, they're asking you the hope that's in you. Where, where's this coming from? Where, where is it that you have this reason to hope when everybody else is screaming, jump off the bridge, or, or let's go hide in a cave somewhere, or whatever. It's the light of the Holy Spirit that shines in you, that shines from you into their darkness. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Well, there's only one chapter, but verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We have to keep doing what we've been doing all along. Believe in what the Word of God says in spite of what the circumstances are, in spite of what the daily broadcasts and news and, you know, politicians and others are trying to shove down our throat 24 hours a day. This is the truth. Everything else, as far as I'm concerned, is darkness. Some may not be as dark as others, but it's still darkness. This is the light. It's the light that will shine into the face of the lies of the enemy. Amen? It's the light that comes to those who have been blinded by the lies of the devil. By human belief. By man's intellect. The choices they, they, I mean, we hear stuff and I'm thinking, why, 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 do, why would we even listen to that? It is anti-Christ. It is anti-God. It's all about, we know from experience, you don't know squat. I mean, I've listened to enough of it to know you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have a clue. But you're trying to get me to believe it. Well, now here's the deal. If I don't have the Holy Spirit and do not have the Word of God available to me, I'm going to buy that crap. I'm going to believe it because I have no, no absolute truth or faults in my life. The only absolute is right here. And if I don't have that, then I'm stuck with everybody else's opinion. And then I just choose which one I want to go with. And that's what we're seeing all around us, everywhere. In this nation specifically, but it's all over the world. In some, in some places far worse than this. But I'm more concerned about what's happening here where my family, where my friends, where my relatives live, right? I don't want to see this go down just because of stupid humans. And neither does God. When He's given us the wisdom of the world, a means by which we can transform this into a paradise again. Amen? We don't have to be afraid of Jesus coming back. We just occupy. Right? We're just occupying. He'll come when He comes. We don't have to worry about it. It's they that are, need to be worried about it, but they don't have sense enough to know. Somebody has to be a light. Somebody has to stand in this and say, there's something better. Pray for them, that the Holy Spirit would move on them. Every, every morning, I pray for my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and I say all that will come after them. Because there's going to be, I, I, I'm not going to be here forever, and if the Lord doesn't come back in my lifetime, there's going to be more little Nathans popping up. And that, that could be very dangerous for the rest of the world unless they know the Lord. If you know what I'm saying, praise the Lord. But I want, them all, I want my family all together in heaven. I, I, don't want to, I, don't, I don't care that I won't know. I know now and I want to make sure. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me or I, I would, the Lord, I would have never been saved. Somebody probably, I don't even know. Somebody who lived generations before me. I had a preacher in my ancestry back in the 1700s was a, was a minister. I'm sure somehow he was praying. Lord, I, I, I'm a patriarch of this family. And it's my responsibility and my privilege to pray for their souls, to pray for their lives, even ones that I'll never know in this life. Praise the Lord. Obviously, the ones that are here, I want saved, you know, but there's going to be lots of others that I'll love just as much if I had the relationship, right? They're still a, they're still a part of me. They're still a part of the genealogy, right? And that's what God is trying to get us to understand. Luke 19 and 13. Let me back up here. I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself here if I don't back off. Besides, I'm trying to break a record. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. 
Of course we're in the last days. I'm not arguing the point. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're not. Look at Acts 2.17. And it will come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And it goes on, right? So we know we're in the last days. We've been in the last days since the book of Acts. Since the resurrection of Jesus, right? In Hebrews 1 and 2, it says, in, in the old times, in old days, it was the prophets. And, the, and they would come and share. But God says, now it is through my son Jesus that I am revealed. That I am made known. Right? So, we know we're in the last days. We just don't know exactly how last we are. Right? And every generation has been this way. Jesus and Paul talked about them being in the last days then. There's already Antichrist among us, he said. So, all we really know is it's later than it's ever been before. Praise the Lord. I believe that the best description of our world, and specifically here in the U.S., is Romans 1, 18 through 32. And again, I'm not railing on homosexuality. I, I, I'm just saying it's just one sign of the times that we live in. I love people that have issues. I've had them all my life. Just being homosexual wasn't one of them. But I had plenty of others, right, that in the eyes of God are no different. It's just this is where we're at today. Amen. And so for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now how in the world could we come to a place where we murder innocent unborn babies by the millions every year? How? And I'm not, I'm not railing on somebody who's had an abortion. I'm just saying to have that mindset that this is okay, that this is normal, tells you how dark things are. It tells you how far people are from the Word of God and how much they're making decisions based on their own intellect or their own desires or somebody else's philosophy. There ought to be, I mean, it ought to be a given. There are some absolutes in this world. And one of them is you don't kill innocent kids. You don't kill little babies. And just looking at physiologically, you think, how is this male, male, female, female, how's that supposed to work? When the reason for marriage is to procreate. You can adopt all you want, but you're not going to procreate. It, I mean, we're not getting into the anatomy of it, but I mean, it's just obvious, right? So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. I remember 9-11, and all these congressmen and senators standing out in front of the Capitol praying as though they really were believing. That was the biggest bunch of BS I'm still upset about it, to be quite honest with you, because they, might, they believe that there is a God, but they have no sense of responsibility to His truth or to His Word. They're still going by their own intellect. They're saying, yeah, there's a God, and we're, we're doing this because some of you people believe that, and you, you may vote. But the truth is, it's all BS. We're the only ones that really know, because we're so brilliant, because we're so wise. I mean, just, just listen to them the way they talk to us. It's so demeaning. I mean, to me, it's, it just really irritates the crap out of me that they are so condescending that they think I'm such a moron that everything that comes out of their mouth, I'm going to go, oh, yeah, well, thank God I've heard from them. No, you just heard from another idiot that doesn't know anything more than you do. The only thing that separates me from them is this. And that's why David said, I'm wiser than all of my teachers. He wasn't being belligerent. He was just saying, you can teach me anything you want to, but the bottom line is this. And if you don't know this, you don't know Sikkim. Praise the Lord. Amen. So professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and to creeping things. 
Wherefore God also gave them up to their own uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature or man more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to it vile affections. For even the women did change their natural use in that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. I'm not trying to be, again, I'm not trying to be ugly and sound like some Bible-thumping maniac. I'm just saying, if this is true, we know what this stuff leads to. And why? Because if I can't do what I want to do, then I'm going to deny that there's a God who says you're not supposed to do it. That way I don't have to feel guilty about it. Because we're enlightened. You know, we're so brilliant. We've got college educations. We've got degrees. We've got internet. We've got all this BS. So surely we must know what we're talking about. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. That's why we've got parades for some of the most weird, goofy. I mean, look, I, I, I may have issues, but I don't expect it. everybody doesn't have to partake of my issues. All right. It's, I mean, if I've got a problem, if whew, that's a big word. Amen. But if I got a problem, I'm not making everybody else get on my parade. I'm not asking everybody else to get on my wagon and, and, and agree with me. I got a problem. Can you relate? <laughs> Call it love hate. Okay, look, I, sorry, I regress. But I'm just saying, <laughs> praise the Lord. I, I know I, I've got flaws. But my flaw, I'm not trying to make you participate in my flaws to make me feel better about my flaws. Yeah. I know that they're not right. If I've got an issue, it, and all i got to do is look here to find out, yeah, i got an issue, but the grace of God and the mercy of God and the goodness of God will keep me even with that issue. But I'm not asking you to participate in my issues. But that's what the world does. Hey, we're nuts, but we want everybody, everybody's got to be nuts with us. Or else you're a bigot. Right? I'm saying we have to love the people, every person, regardless of their issues, regardless of their idiosyncrasies and, and, and their sicknesses and their insanity. Because such were some of us. Yes. And just because my issue wasn't, isn't their issue, my issue was just as relevant, just as problematic. So we've got to love them. But I don't have to embrace it. I don't have to do it. I don't have to, you know, celebrate it. I've got to point them to God. I've got to get them somehow to see that there's a, there is a, not just a relativism, but a real truth, a solid, factual truth that you can rely on that doesn't change with every generation or the next weird idea that comes up in somebody's head that now becomes everybody's business. Everybody's got to do this or else, or else you're a horrible person. Oh, I bet I get some emails, praise the Lord. <laughs> Save them, because I, I'm not interested. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be hateful. Yeah. And I'm not going to go down the list and tell you I know this and I know somebody here. I do, believe me, I, I know people, right? And I love them. Literally. I, I have family members, extended family members. And I love them. They're my family. They're, they're related to me. But I still don't like the idea of them living in belief their, what God has for them. You say that's judging. No, I, look, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying. Yes. It's not a productive, it's not a positive lifestyle. And I mean, really, in comparison to the murdering of millions of babies, it's a small thing. In my mind, 
right? How, how in the world can a nation just turn its head and say, okay, we're going to kill another man? I, this is, I'm not, the specifics of this won't be ac totally accurate, but I'll, I'm going to share it anyway. When, when COVID-19 hit in Texas, the governor of Texas banned abortions. He said they were not essential. And so immediately a court convened and said, yes, it is, and you have to have them. He took it to another court. And the next court agreed with him and said, no, they are not essential. They'll be suspended until this thing is dealt with, until we get to a place where we can do it, right? So I think it was for like two months or two and a half months of this initial thing, there were no abortions in Texas. I think, and I, again, I'm, the, the, the deviation from one to the other is accurate, just the numbers probably won't be. But there were, I'll say, a thousand people died of COVID-19 in that two and a half, three months. But 10,000 children were saved. 10,000 lives were saved because one person said, that's not essential. It's just something you do because it's convenient. And 10,000 lives were saved. I, I mean, I, I don't know how a nation can just look at this stuff and say, well, it's just the way it is. This is the, this is the 21st century. No, it's insanity is what it is. It's demonic. It takes what happened in Egypt to a level they didn't even understand. It takes the killing of babies in, in Bethlehem in, at Jesus' birth time to a level that they couldn't have imagined then, even though there were hundreds, if not thousands, of children being murdered. That happens in one day. In one country, in one, in one state. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. They re-elect them. They pat them on the back. This is uplifting, isn't it? Praise the Lord. But, even with all of this, our culture is not quite Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason is, remember, God would have saved them if there had been ten righteous. But there weren't ten righteous. But there are today. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Otherwise, this place would be a smoking ash pit right now, probably. I mean, if God was going to do, I mean, I've heard, we've all heard it said before, if God doesn't do something, he's going to owe an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, no, because there's more righteous here. Righteousness still is in the land. It may not be dominant, but it's still here. It's still holding back the flood tide. It's still holding back the darkness to some extent. Genesis 18, uh, verses 32 and 33. So we look around and we get angry, and I'm angry and I'm upset, and I'd like to do some stuff. And <laughs> Amen. And, you know, when things are like this, stress levels rise, and your tendency to maybe flip a little quicker than normal. Like you'd just like to take a trip to Washington, D.C., and just have one long slap line. I mean, it's just crazy. And he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. This is, this, this is Abraham speaking to God. Or, or excuse me, this is Lot. No, it's Abraham speaking to God. Because God's going to go to Sodom and destroy the place. It's evil. It's full of sick, perverted crap. It's, it's full of what I've just been talking about. And the anger in me and a lot of us rises to a level where we just want to see judgment. I want to see somebody pay for all of this, right? Not knowing that I might be paying for something myself along the lines. But here he says, 
Let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak with you once more. Just let me give me one more chance. Now, he's already prayed a half a dozen times here, asking, if there's a hundred righteous, will you spare the... No, what about... And, of course, Abraham knows there's probably not a hundred there, so he's taking it little by little. And then he comes back, and he said, let me, give, let me just say one more thing here, Lord. I know I've got your attention, so I don't want to, I don't want to bore you, but, but what if there's only 50? And the Lord said, I'll spare it for 50. He keeps going, right? He keeps praying. He's interceding. He's saying, what we should be doing now, instead of me being angry up here and, and complaining and, and, you know, wanting to hurt somebody, I should be praying. I should be praying, God, if, you, if there's ten righteous, will you spare this land? Will you give us another chance? Will you give us an opportunity for the light to shine here? Will you make this a, a, a bed that you can lie in? A safe place. And, and said the Lord be angry. And, and per adventure, ten. He said, I'm, he's all the way down to 10 now. And he said, what, what, what about if there's, if, if there's only 10 of them that are righteous, that are believers? And God said, I won't destroy it for 10's sake. If there's 10, I won't destroy it. I'll let the chaos, I'll let the horror, I'll let the filth continue because of the 10 righteous that have such value to me. And the Lord went his way. And as soon as he had left communing with Abram, Abraham returned unto his place, and we know that there weren't ten righteous. Praise the Lord. Shouldn't we be doing what the Bible says? As angry as I get, as frustrated as I get, and the natural part of me wants to rage, wants to scream, wants to holler, wants to go stand in the window and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's not the answer. The answer is get on my knees and pray that the Holy Ghost will move in people's lives and that God will spare this land for the righteous that are here so that we can have an impact on the unrighteousness all around us. Occupy till he comes. Do business for the Lord. Luke 19.13. I'm going to wrap up here pretty quick. A couple more scriptures. Because I'm not going to make it to an hour 40 something. So I'll just might as well throw in the towel. He called his ten servants and he delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. So the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we, we gain more and more faith through the Word of God. So God gives us this. And it's portioned only because of us, not because of God, to the amount that we receive, right? In other words, we can get as much faith as we want to get for whatever the situation is. All we've got to do is take it. So he called his servants and he get, delivered them 10 pounds and he said to them, here's the Holy Spirit. You're born again. Now occupy till I come. Occupying is not giving up ground. Are you with me? Occupying is saying we're, we are the ones who are in charge. You're here. But we're here to occupy this territory for God until he comes. Amen? So, going back to Acts 17, and Paul's preaching to the Greeks. How could he explain the gospel or the word of God to them so that they would understand it? That's our dilemma, isn't it? The Greek culture had the wrong foundation. Their foundation was man's word, not God's. Man's philosophy, not God's theology. That's the world we're living in for the most part. So Acts chapter 17 again. Let's look at this 22 and through 29. I can do it if, if you can't get it back up. It's Paul again. He's on Mars Hill there. And he says... Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found to an altar this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly, praise the Lord, whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Amen? The God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped. Right, right, we have read all of this. One blood of all nations, 
Amen. We're all equal. Praise the Lord in the eyes of God that they should seek the Lord if the happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Praise the Lord. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stones graven by art and man's device. God is invisible. Amen. And then he drops down to verse 32 and he says, And when these pagans, when these unbelievers, these multiple God worshipers, these hedonistic uh, intellectuals, amen, heard it, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked. That's a shock, isn't it? Some of them mocked. Some of them said, oh, you moron, you poor, simple-minded fool. But others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was stirring them. Faith, enough faith for them to think, maybe this could be true. So what did Paul do? He took them back to the most fundamental place where we begin. God created everything. He's the author and finisher of it all. Amen? So in a sense, Paul was saying, let me give you the right starting point. And let me get you on the right road so that you can understand the message of the cross. Some mocked, but some listened. And I'm going to tell you this, as angry as I can get, and as frustrated as I can get with things that I see going on around me, my response has to be love. It has to be to embrace the person, not the behavior, not the actions, but the individual, because that's what Jesus did everywhere he went. Yes. Woman caught in the act of adultery. She got caught in the act of adultery. Now, the guy obviously got, got away. But what she did was wrong. I mean... If, you're, if you were her husband, you'd, you'd think it was wrong. Or the guy's wife that she was with, you'd say it was wrong, right? But Jesus said, he didn't say it wasn't wrong. He just said, look, the only way that you're ever going to know that there's more to God than punishment is for some grace to come. And he said, I'm, those that condemn you are not here because they all deserve to be condemned themselves. I'm the only one that is in a position to condemn you, and I refuse to because you're too valuable to me, because I love you too much. Now go and sin no more. He gave her the opportunity to break away from the condition she was in, from the circumstances she found herself in, whatever they were, whatever the motivation was for. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. It's just that Jesus loved her more than the behavior. Now, that's not going to be easy, folks, because we've got some ugly stuff going on all around us. I'm talking about, again, the murdering, the... The, the, the chaotic nature of strife and hatred and envy and just for no reason other than just human ignorance. Hating people because of the color of their skin, because of this or that or the other. I mean, come on. We're, we're better than this. I'm just saying, my, I'm trying to make a point. I don't know if I'm doing anything. But my point is that we can't assume people are, that we're talking to, people that we're interacting with, understand Christianese. That they understand scriptures the way we do, if we just quote scripture to them, right? Or why we believe the way we believe. Amen? We've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. We've got to be led by the Holy Ghost. That's why this has to be an act of God, an act of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not move if there's envy and there's strife and there's hatred and variance. There has to be love. There has to be forgiveness. There has to be mercy. There has to be an outreach to people to let them know, I know you're acting like a fool. I've been there. But God loves you. And he wants you to understand the condition that you're in is partly your making. It's not God. It's not the judgment of God. It's a society that has lost touch with God that has allowed these things to happen. Amen. I mean, just think about it. What, what, and I'm not trying to get down this road either, but just, just think about slavery. Just an example. Christians were saying, this is right. God's backing us. What the hell were they thinking? 
They were thinking about themselves, about their pocketbooks, about their money, not about the righteousness of God and the equality of all of God's children. So this isn't new. It isn't like it just happened. It's just that like everything else with the devil, it escalates with every generation. Right? I mean, I grew up with the Lone Ranger and Roy Rogers, right? Now it's gay channels. It's, it's you know, uh, just stuff you can't, you can't imagine it would ever be on TV. You look at it and you go, what? Wow, who, who's watching this? Yeah. Who's buying the advertising for this thing to be on? <sighs> Dykes, queer, queens, you know. If, if we say that, we're bigots. But they say it about themselves all the time. They, get, they have TV shows. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. We have to be led by the Word of God. Not religion, not denominations, not our own personal values or feelings. We've got to be equipped with answers to be ready to operate supernaturally in the love of God and in the grace of God in order for God to be revealed, for His glory to be revealed. See, it, it may seem like, and I've got to tell you, there's times when I feel like I'm just, I'm just, being a, I'm just lying down. I'm just being a doormat. No. God's the one that's in charge of this. My job is to love people, to forgive people, to show the mercy of God, and let God take care of the rest of it. It's hard to do sometimes because we want to be the ones to correct them. You idiot! Don't you realize how fouled up you are? Oh, that's going to win a lot of people to Jesus, I promise you. Now, we need to be just like Jesus with the woman caught in the act of adultery. We need to be just like Jesus when he looked at me in all of my mess, with all of my issues, with all of my hatred and anger and frustration and, and uh, addictions and everything else and say, that's my beloved son. Amen. Come home. I got a, I got a new outfit for you. I got a party planned. A big feast just for you with all of your issues you're still my son in whom I am well pleased you got to swallow hard to do it but that's what we have to be doing and I'll tell you what it'll 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 cause people to question their motives when they look at us and we say love you brother love you sister in whatever their issue is in their actions and their behaviors we're not condoning it. It isn't like God's going to get mad at us and say, oh, how dare you act like that's okay. Hey, he's the one that set this thing up. He's the one that made it possible for us to do what I'm talking about doing. To love him in spite of the stuff. To love him in spite of the mess. The only way they're going to come to God is to find out that he loves them more than the thing that they're involved in. And he's got something better. Something satisfying. It's called abundant life. Not just a sick, weird life that you try to force onto everybody else. I'm not trying to force this onto anybody. I'm trying to make it available to anybody and everybody. First Samuel 3.21, let's go back to where we started and we'll close. So God is wanting to appear by his word so they can see him. Not with these eyes but with the eyes of the heart. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord had revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, and he revealed himself by his word. We can be a vis visual representation of God. We are the spiritual representation of God in this earth, and we can be a physical representation if we will agree with this word, if we'll stand on this word and not be moved from it. And God's glory will come through. 2 Corinthians 4, again, 4 through 6. Last scripture. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to you.
That's our responsibility. That's why we're in this time. If there's anything that, that frightens me about these last days, it isn't, uh, you know, giant locusts the size of Volkswagens and, and all this other, you know, kind of weird stuff that we've gotten from uh, the book of Revelation. The thing that concerns me and frightens me more is that I won't be the representation that he's had me here for. That I'll be something less than that. That I'll be vindictive. That I'll be just as guilty as they are, only on the opposite side. That's not where we want to be. That's what religion has done. Believers in God have to be lovers of humanity. It's not easy because, it, I mean, just think about how ugly it was for Jesus to be stripped naked, hung on the cross after beaten and rejected and hated and spit on and mocked and say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Their eyes have been blinded. Let the light of the glorious gospel shine through me. That's what Jesus was saying, and that's what we have to say today. Open the eyes of the blind. Open the deaf ears. Set captives free by the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Appearing of the Lord in his glory. I'm, I'm just saying this. I'm closed. But it's going to happen. It's, it's got to happen because it's right here. The question is, when will the last day be? And that, amazingly, God has left up to us. Amen? He knows the end from the beginning. He knows that day, but he hasn't set that day. We set that day. It's when the body of Christ really begins to rise up into full maturity, into the full stature of Jesus Christ, which means we start to function the way Jesus did. And I'm not just talking about miracles and signs and wonders. I'm talking about the grace of God and the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When that happens, then look up. Because your redemption will be drawn nigh. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I hope I haven't depressed you. This is positive business, man. I mean, this is positive. This is what God wants to do in all of us. All we have to do. So the, the good news is we don't have to judge. We don't have to be critical. We don't have to be hateful. I've, I've done all that for you this morning. Now, I'm just saying, I'm just talking about true emotions. But the emotions cannot rule our lives. The truth of God's word is what has to rule. We have to submit to the word and the enemy will flee. Praise the Lord. Do it. Don't be frightened. Be brave. Be courageous. Because the Lord is on our side. Amen. And he's going to bring an end to this insanity. And I want to be part of that. I want to be part of ushering in the glory of God. Not the punishment of every poor decision people have made. Amen. It's easier to love than it is to hate. It's a lot easier on yourself. I got myself worked up. I almost got an ulcer here this morning. <laughs> get some work, get some mad. Amen. I mean, you know, we can do that. You, you, your, your emotions will follow your thinking. If you're not grounded in the Word of God, your emotions will rule, and it'll get ugly in a hurry. Praise the Lord. God loves these people too much for us to be arrogant and think that, let it go, let them go. Let's love them. Let's love them right into the arms of God and see how this world changes. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you again. Thank you so much for your patience this morning. Have a great week. Love like you can.